All right, uh, open up your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. While we do that, does anybody need a Bible? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We were in this last week, um, and I felt like there's some things that the Lord still wants to say about it. And uh, so I'm going to refresh our memory as we see what we looked at last week. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says this, starting in verse 1. Again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And they declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive, but better than both is he who has not been and who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Just as a reminder, uh, Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom. It's a book where um, he's trying to pass on what life is about. And basically, Solomon, as he writes this, is someone who's experienced lots of different things about life. And he is probably in many respects through the book of Ecclesiastes saying, I got a lot of it wrong. And many people would look at Solomon and think, man, that's the life. He's the king. I mean, he has got like 600 like, wives and concubines and all that kind of stuff. So he, he's got all that kind of stuff. He's got a, a large um, wealth. He, he's one of the wealthiest kings that Israel has known. I mean, everything in, in his world seems to be, from that perspective, going well. But he looks at his own life and he's looking back on it going, look, I've tried everything under the sun. Life is not about money. Life is not about sex. Life is not about education. Life is not about pleasure. Life is not about all these things. I, I've been there. I've done that. And it's not. And as he begins to look at, back on his life and reflect on it, he's trying to save people from his mistakes and, and save people from looking at him and saying, hey, you want to pursue this. And so many things about the book of Ecclesiastes, he's saying, I have seen, I have experienced, and it isn't good. Uh, all the parts of Ecclesiastes are not just the things that he experienced, but, but things that he looks around and he sees, and he recognizes that's not good either. And Ecclesiastes 4 is, is one of the things where it's, he's looking around and he's seeing something. We put into this out last week. When he looks around, he sees something. What does he see? He sees oppression. And he sees the tears of the oppressed. He, he sees people who are um, broken and are um, emotional about the circumstances of their lives. He sees it and he notices it. And one of the things I think that he was trying to point out was, you can see oppression and never be moved by it. You can see atrocities and have never really touched your heart. But what he's trying to drive home is, I've seen all this stuff going on and it's not good, and it hit my heart because I saw their tears. It became real to me. And, and as I, it became real to me, then I wondered, well, what is life really about if there's all this oppression? What is life really about if there's all this evil? What's life about if, if these things can happen? If, what's life about if, if that bad thing's allowed? What's life like, or what, what's the importance of life if something like Barcelona can happen? What's the importance of life if, if something like Charlottesville can happen? What's the importance of life if all these different things can happen all the time? It's like, gosh, it's just better not to have been born and live this place. So he looks around and he sees it. But more than just seeing it, he sees their tears, and he, he emotionally begins to connect with it. As he begins to emotionally connect with it, he finds himself in a place of, of further brokenness. He's like, what can be done? Because I look around and I see something. It's what I don't see, actually. I see no comfort. They're oppressed, and there's no comforter. There's this tragedy, and there's no comforter. This, this horrible thing happened, and there's no comfort. Where is he? Where is their comfort? Ecclesiastes goes on, um, and he basically says that if there's going to be a comfort, then I think people have to start responding to it. When, when people look around and they see there's no comfort, they should start to ask, well, maybe, maybe I should be. Maybe I should be the comforter. Maybe I should bring some comfort into that. Is what he begins to, to think. And he, he says it this way in verse 4. And I saw that all the labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is a meaningless chasing after the wind. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Better one handful of tranquility than two handfuls of toil chasing after the wind. 
And it goes on, basically just says, okay, there, there's no comfort, but here's the reason why there's no comfort. It's because people that have money aren't using it to bless people. People who have, are, are better off, they're not using it. So what's happening is, instead of looking around and connecting with the tears of people, instead what they're connecting with and what they're seeing is, I just need more stuff. So it doesn't seem, it seems like in Ecclesiastes he's changed his thoughts here, but he doesn't. He's actually just trying to show why there's no comforter. The reason there's no comfort is that people aren't seeing the tears of people. Instead, they're focused on that bigger TV they should have. Instead, they're focused on the bigger house that they want. Instead, they're focused on um, wealth and acquiring things. And because their eyes are focused on that, they can't see the tears of people and there's no comforter. It's because of that. So some people recognize that the reality is that people just keep chasing money and keep chasing things. And, and so they get woken up by that. Uh, but what he basically goes on and he says is, when you start chasing things, what happens is you just work too hard. You're working so hard, you're working yourself to death. And he says this, you can have two handfuls of toil. He says, that's, that's, that's foolish. Um, said in our vernacular, that's stupid. Why have two handfuls of toil? You should have one handful of toil, because it's good to work, and one handful of peace. Enjoy, enjoy life. And, and don't work so hard, because if you, don't, if you don't work so hard, actually what happens is you can actually begin to see things around you. This is what he's trying to say. All that to say is, um, you also might have a different reaction, which is, well, then, I mean, if this, if this is bad to have two handfuls of toil, then why work at all? So he's like, well, don't get that idea. You don't want two handfuls of tranquility, because you know what happens? You go broke, and you become poor, and you become impoverished, and now you're the one in need. So work. You need to work. Don't be excessive about it. He continues uh, talking more about money, but we're going to skip that, and we're going to get to the more famous part of Ecclesiastes 4, just as a reminder, and then we're going to springboard off of it. Verse 9. says this, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. The cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And basically what he's uh, pointing out here in this very famous passage uh, that isn't really thought about in context. He's really saying there's a bunch of toil going on. There's a bunch of, of oppression going on. and People are oppressed. And you know what's horrible about it? When there is no comforter for the oppressed. What I'm seeing is two are better than one. If there's a person in trouble and there's no one to be by them, that's horrible. This is not a passage about marriage. This is actually a passage where uh, Ecclesiastes is trying to drive home, go be that second person for someone. Pity the person who has no one. Pity the person who has no comfort. Pity the person who has no one to lie next to them. No one to help them when they fall down. No one to help them when they're being overpowered. Go be power for someone. Uh, go be warmth for someone. Go be a sustainer for someone. And he's saying... A cord of three strands is, is not easily broken. Is that when, when Solomon looks around, he sees all this oppression, but he sees no comforter. He sees that the problem is that people around them aren't seeing the tears of people. They're not connecting with it, and they're not coming alongside someone, and they're not uh, becoming that person that's by the side of another. That's what he's saying. That's what we talked about last week. We're caught up. The question is, what are we going to do about it? The question is, how are we supposed to respond? The question is, we see a whole bunch of junk. I hope that our hearts can uh, sometimes feel what other people are feeling. I, I hope that we don't just overlook it. I hope that we don't just say, oh, that's horrible. I'm glad that that didn't happen to me. I hope in some ways we can sit in people's pain and at the same time um, ask the Lord, how can we be a source of comfort? I think we're supposed to. Um, but with that, here's one thing I didn't get a chance to say last week that I want to say. I think our church is actually good at this. So I, I want to say that I, I think that, um, generally speaking, the things that I know, the things that I hear about, uh, people come alongside those that are hurting. People tend in our church to notice uh, the tears of people. They, they tend to sit with them. They tend to um, bring comfort. I mean, I know story after story of people just saying, hey, um, that's a need. Can, can we help with that? And coming alongside and, and helping. And in many respects, while we look at this passage in Ecclesiastes, 
uh, I don't think this is necessarily a corrective verse for our church. I think it's, it's a section for us to continue down the path we're already on, maybe get even better at it. But I do feel like, hey, uh, this isn't a chastisement. I just think from what I know of people, the stories that I know, like, I want to celebrate that. I, I want to celebrate the spikers for a second. I, I want to celebrate that. Here, here, Anna, she's raised by her grandmother, basically. Imagine living thousands and thousands of miles away uh, from your grandmother who raised you with an ocean between you. And she gets news that her grandmother has got a stroke and has two weeks to live, if that. And knowing they have no way to get to Korea. And imagine being Jason for a second whose heart is breaking for his wife. And how, how can I possibly get my wife there? I, I don't even know how to do it. He starts selling stuff. He, he starts doing lots of hard things. He makes lots of hard decisions like, I've got to get my wife to Korea. And in order to get her to Korea, it meant, and we've got to be able to take our two small children because one of them is nursing and can't go without her. And um, just the way things were, it's like, how do I get not just her there, but how do I get our family there? So one of the things that I want you to know about our church, and I don't know if you know it, but I want you to know it. Um, out of our offering, we have a benevolence fund. The benevolence fund is used uh, for people that are in our church congregation. People that we consider like, this is your home church. This is your family, so to speak. We have a benevolence fund. And that is used at different times and different seasons when people are hurting. So when you actually make an offering to the Lord, you're, you're already contributing to that. Because we, we want, as a, a church leadership team, to be able to say, hey, we want to see people's tears. We want to respond to people's tears. We want to listen to the Lord about when and how. Um, so we, we have this fund that's designed for that. And there's lots of things we hear about, some things you hear about, some things you don't. And we, we just look at it and say, is, is this something that God wants us to come alongside and be a comfort? When you give to the offering, you're giving to that. I only tell you that because people don't always know what, what happens when... I make an offering to the Lord. And part of it's used for that. So I called up um, someone on our leadership team and I said, hey, here's what's going on with the spikers. What can we do? And so he's like, well, we got some. I'm like, okay. And he goes, but honestly, I think this is a GoFundMe thing. I'm like, okay. So we, we gave out of the offering, but we knew that wasn't enough. He's like, but just encourage him to do a GoFundMe. We put a GoFundMe out there, and a GoFundMe is just a crowdfunding thing. You put it up online where, uh, on, for them, we used YouCaring. So you might have seen a little website that came up with YouCaring. In three days, they had everything they needed and a little bit more. They got to Korea. And if you didn't see the update, they got there in time. She saw her grandmother, and within 12 hours, she died. But what I want to say is, this is not a very big congregation. That was a, a very big need. And in just a matter of a few hours, people saw the need, saw the tears, and said, hey, I want to come alongside. So I want to celebrate. Because that's, that's kind of who I know this congregation of people to be. That's one story of many. There's tons of them. I could tell you more, but the reality is that was just the closest one. Just, just like a week ago. And they got there. I want to celebrate the compassion that the Lord has given this community. Um, but with it, what I also want you to know is what happens with the offering. And where, what our, our thought process is behind that. Now, when I say that, I, I want you to relax. This is not a giving message. This, isn't a, this is not what that is. I just want you to know what God's heart is in light of Ecclesiastes 4. I want you to know what his heart is and what we think from a leadership team, like how, how, do, we, how do we handle the offering that the Lord has given us and what do we do with it? So I just want you to know what Scripture says. I'm going to walk us through several. We'll go through them quickly. I'm not going to unpack a lot of them, but we're just going to see some of them. I want you to know what God's heart is. And some of that I'm going to look at the Old Testament. Now here's that. Look at the Old Testament with us. Here's what I want you to know. Uh, Old Testament law, you're not under. You're not under it at all. I don't want you to read this and go, oh my gosh, i got to do this. 
That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to help you see the heart of God. I want you to see what God's heart is and why, what he, he thought was important. As you begin to see what he thought was important, then you begin to see the heart of God. As you begin to see the heart of God, then you might have a better understanding of what you'd want to do with your own resources. Um, but you're under no compulsion. You're not under the law. And there's no such thing as a 10%. That's Old Testament. You're free. New Testament doesn't exist. Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 to 22 says this. This is part of the law, what, how God instructed the Israelites. Don't mistreat or oppress a foreigner. For you are foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. This is part of the law. Do you see what God's heart is? He's setting up an entire community of people. He's, he's saying, you're going to be a nation. You're going to be a nation known by my name. And here's what I, I don't want you to do. I, I want you to never mistreat or oppress a foreigner. Why? Because you were foreigners in Egypt. You used to be a slave. You used to be a foreigner. Don't you ever treat someone else like that. You know what it feels like? Well, let's just, uh, I read that today and I'm like, maybe we should read that. We are a country of foreigners. We're a melting pot. Every single, I'm, my family wasn't born. If I chase the line back, we were not born here. We came here at some point. We're a country full of it. And when, when I look back in history, I, I see a country full of it, and I see lots of strife all the way through that process of new people coming in. I mean, the same things that are being said today were said a long time ago when, you know, Irish people were here and German people were here and those people were here. Like, it, it's always this, this blending thing. That it's hard when, when different cultures collide. We have a melting pot. And the reality is that what God was telling the Israelites is like, here's the deal. You're going to have some, some foreigners. Eh, you better not treat, mistreat them and don't oppress them. Don't take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. The reality is when you're in a position of power, it's easy to take advantage. When you're in a position of power, it's really easy to oppress. And, and here's where some of that oppression happens. Um, I'm sorry if this hits close to home. It's just something that hits my heart when I read this. Sometimes we hire um, a certain group of people to do some work, and we think we can hire them with a six-pack instead of actually paying them a wage. What I mean is you'll, you'll go to a 7-Eleven and you'll find a line of people that are willing to just do some work. Whether they're legal or not, that doesn't really matter. They're there and they're, they're, they're hungry and they're just trying to, trying to make a dollar. And very often people will, will say, I'll give you a six-pack of beer if you'll build this wall for me. It happens a lot. It happens much more than people realize. It's, it's a very common thing. In fact, in many respects, our country is set up in, in many ways to oppress people who um, are here illegally. And, and sometimes we actually use their fear about being here illegally to our advantage. Don't mistreat or oppress a foreigner. Whether they should be here or not, this is not a political statement. That's for people above my pay grade to decide. I don't decide that. But if I see someone, I don't want to oppress them. I don't want to take advantage of them. And if they're really in need, how can I help? Part of God's heart is to not oppress people and to not take advantage. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7 11 says this If anyone is poor among you, among your fellow Israelites, if any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard hearted or tight fisted towards them. Just don't. It's self explanatory. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. All I, all I think we're supposed to remember about that is, think of your life like this. I'm open-handed. If you and I walk through life, it's like, I'm open-handed. The way I, I kind of look at it is, like, um, there, are, there are some resources God's given me. And I'm really, really thankful. But I don't want to live my life this way, with the resources he's given me. Instead, I want to say, you gave it to me anyway. How do you want to use it? Those are yours. I wouldn't have anything unless you, unless you blessed me. I wouldn't have a dang thing in my life. I mean, even if I went to work, even if I earned the money, honestly, my health, that's from the Lord. My strength to get up in the morning is from the Lord. Everything I have is from the Lord. Just be open-handed. Um, does that mean so open-handed that there's nothing left? No. Does that mean so open-handed that um, you're not taking care of yourself? No. It just means going through life with a willingness to say, hey, if that's, 
if it's, it's needed to give it away, I'm willing. I'm willing. This is about the motive of the heart. This isn't about make yourself poor. It's about do you live open-handed or do you live close-fisted? What's the condition of the heart? And God just says, just, just be willing. Deuteronomy 24, 17, don't deprive the foreigner of the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of a widow as a pledge. You know, sometimes people are a widow or people are um, in poverty, they need a loan. Sometimes people who are not in poverty need a loan. But the reality is that um, if you find a widow or someone who's really impoverished and needs a loan, here's what, what is he saying? Don't take her cloak as a pledge. What he's really trying to say is, help the widow out and, and don't give a loan in such a way that it makes them poorer than they were before. Just help them out. Leviticus 23, 22. I know nobody reads Leviticus. But when you reap a harvest of your land, this is the law. When you reap a harvest of the land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I'm the Lord your God. You know what he says? This is, the, this is the law of the land. This is how God set it up. Here's what I want you to do. You've got a business. You're a farmer. That's what they, most of them were. They were farmers. And they had land and they would um, cultivate it. And they would have a crop that would come in. When the crop comes in, you harvest the field. When you harvest the field, uh, what happens is very often you don't get everything the first time. It happens today too, even with all our technology. You don't get everything the first time. And um, what he's saying here is, here's what you need to do. Purposely leave stuff behind. Leave stuff behind. So that the poor can come by and get the stuff you missed the first time. It's called the gleanings. Um, here it's saying, leave stuff on the edges so they can come get it. What he's just saying is, live in such a way that the poor can find a way to easily come get from you what, what they need, just to survive. And is have margin in your life. Have margin in your life that allows for you to be more open-handed a little bit. What I, here's what I mean by margin. Here's what I think he means by this is, clearly they've got a field. Clearly they're harvesting it. Clearly they're living off of it. And clearly they're deciding that they're purposely leaving some behind which means they're budgeting. Which means that they're saying, this is what we will live off of. And that is what the poor will live off of. Is it in your budget? Is it in your mindset to say, this is what I need to live, and, is, and this is so that others can have something too. This is what I'll leave, live on, and this is my Ecclesiastes 4. So the, the reality is that when we talk about being open-handed, it's the decision on the front end to say, here's my budget, here's my willingness, here's what I need, here's what I have to live on. This is what it costs to live here. This is what the rent is. This is what food costs. This is what that costs. That's okay. But then beyond that, that's my open-handedness. I mentioned this last week. My friends decided a long time ago when they are very early in their, their lives, and, and now they're um, near retirement, but they made this decision decades ago decided, how much do we need to live off of? Once they made that decision, they then planned that way. When they got raises, that became their margin. They didn't, start, they, didn't, they didn't grow their budget. They didn't grow the house they lived in. They said, no, we're fine. We already know what we need. We're completely fine. Our margin got bigger. Who else can we help? That was their mindset. And, and this is kind of what he's saying in Leviticus. Deuteronomy 23, 24 through 25 says, If you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want, but do not put any in your basket. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. See, the thing is, God's thinking about both people. You see, God thinks about the open-handed, not just the poor. So he puts it in the law of the land. Look, Yes, there's gleaning, and there's laws to protect those who are widows, and there's laws to protect those who are poor. But the poor can't do this either. The poor can't just walk into any field and go, I'm taking that. The other thing the poor can't do is they can't come through and bring us a big basket and say, well, I'll take a lot of this. No, in fact, what it's saying is that the widows and the orphans and the poor, they can only take what they'll eat right then and what they need. This is not a way to get rich off the rich. It's not what it's for. It's really only meant to meet the immediate need of those that are poor and have nothing to eat in that moment. 
Because the idea of God is that people would work. And so sometimes people are finding themselves in poverty is because they're not working. Sometimes people find themselves in poverty because circumstances stink and life crashed. And, but God wants to provide for both scenarios. And for those who just aren't, aren't um, able to work or people have certain circumstances, God's like, well, we're going to provide for them. But for those who have the ability but refuse to just because they're lazy, well, God says, no, no, you, you can only take what you need. If you want to start acquiring, then go get a job. It's kind of what his point is. Just take what you need. Proverbs 10, 4 says, Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And Proverbs 19, 15 says, Laziness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle man will suffer hunger. And God's very well aware that idleness and laziness is not a good thing. and He doesn't want to promote that. And part of our open-handedness shouldn't promote that. But the margin of the field is, is meant for those that really have nothing to eat, so they just come in and get what they need. Proverbs 13, 18 says, Whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, and whoever heeds correction is honored. This is another one we um, practically follow, and I want you to know about it. Churches get benevolence requests all the time. In fact, we have a benevolence fund. It's not new, it's not unique, and it's not something that, wow, look what they do. Never thought of that before. Everybody, every church does it. Uh, every church has them. We, we all do this, and we want to we help out the poor. We get tons of requests, though. Every church gets tons and tons and tons of requests. And so you have to, press pro you have to process through, and you have to pray through, how does God want us to respond to this? Um, sometimes when people are in a position of need, what we will commonly say is, let's sit down, let's talk about what your situation is, let's learn about what the circumstances are, and let's see how we can help you. And sometimes helping is education. Sometimes helping you is helping you budget. Sometimes helping you is helping you find a job. Sometimes helping you is giving you some money to get through a tough season. Sometimes helping you is a combination of all these things. Whenever we give out a benevolence, um, we have conversations along those lines, and very often we have requirements of how to uh, grow in that position. Sometimes people are there because circumstances just dictate that. But sometimes people got there because they were lazy. And so sometimes they also got there because they just didn't know. They had no knowledge of what to do with money. So we want to come alongside and we want to give instruction. We want to give help that's not just about, um, uh, I'm probably thinking of this because Michael and I were going to go fishing. We don't want to give people fish. We want to teach people to fish. But we use our benevolence fund when it's an emergency and saying, hey, you need a helping hand to get up here and then coupled with this, uh, move in this direction. So benevolence is all, almost always accompanied with some of those follow-up questions. This is one of the reasons why it was so easy to give um, to the spikers and so easy to throw it out there. Because I didn't have to say anything to him. He says, Rick, I'm selling this, I'm selling this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I'm listening to him. I'm like, man, you need some help. You're doing everything you can. You're doing everything under your, your power. You're, you're sacrificial. You're doing all that. You just need some help. That's easy. But, but sometimes when people come and receive a benevolence, they're, they're so quick and easy to receive the benevolence, but not quick and easy to receive um, some discipline about how to move forward and how to be sustaining. So we, we do that also with our benevolence fund. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. I think this one's misquoted a lot, so I want to clear it up a little bit. This is used all the time. People know this one. Maybe you've never heard it, but this is one that's used a lot with the offering. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Commonly used for the offering. Let me tell you about it, and let me put it in context. You've got to understand this one. You've got to understand God's heart. We've always started to see in the law of God's heart. God's heart's for the poor. God's heart's for the oppressed. God's heart is for those who are hurting. God's heart is he sees the tears. And God's heart is like, I, I want to help. And I want my people to be a people that begin to respond to this. This is what I want. This is my heart. So he has a thing that is there called the tithe. The tithe does a couple things. People know about one part of the tithe. They don't always know about the second part of the tithe. One part of the tithe was, yes, it took care of the Levitical priests. The Levitical priests they took care of them because they did not have an inheritance. Every tribe of Israel received an inheritance. They got a land within the, the land that God gave them. 
So to Dan, they got this grouping of land. To um, uh, all these other tribes, they got different, different parts of land. Levi, the tribe of Levi, got nothing because they were the priests. And they weren't to get an inheritance. The Lord was their inheritance, and they were to serve in the temple. And so the offering took care of their needs. It's part of it. It's not all of it. The second part of the tithe was actually for the poor. It was a food tithe. People would bring in a tithe. It would go into the storehouse, and it would be there for the poor. It would be there to, to help them out when they were in times of need. So it wasn't simply relying on the field and the margin. It was actually a storehouse that would be there that they could distribute to those that were in need. That's what it was for. So God says, test me in this. You fill the storehouse, I'll take care of the poor, and you won't have any in here. And you, want, you know what's going to also happen? I'm just going to bless you because you actually got my heart. It's not about the giving. It's about the heart. You have a heart for the poor. You have a heart for the oppressed. You have a heart for those who are in trouble. You have a heart for that. Because you have a heart for that, test me in this. I'm going to throw open the doors. And it says this. It goes on. It says, you know what? Things aren't going to break in your life as much. I mean, so stuff will go wrong. But as you have this heart, and I see that heart, I'll continue to bless you because you're blessing others. And my heart is to bless the oppressed, and my heart is to bless the poor. Because of that, I'd like to put some uh, blessing in the hands of those who are open-handed. So that I can take care of the poor through you. Test me in this. This is my heart. My heart is for people. My heart is I see their tears. God sees their tears. God sees their pain. God sees their lack. God sees their striving. God sees their wants. God sees their needs. He's saying, I want to bless these people that I see, and I'm going to do it through my people. And here was the people of Israel. For us, it's the church. It's through the church that God should begin to distribute this love, care, and concern. That's what we should do. Our, our offering, benevolence is part of it. But we also make sure that we give to the poor. We also make sure that we give to the oppressed. We've, we've um, helped ministries that work with uh, women who are battered, beaten, and as sex slave trafficking. That's an oppression that sickens me. And we make sure that our offering goes towards that. When you're giving to the offering, you're actually speaking into that and you are promoting light and God's love to those people in that need. We have sent to um, people in war zones. We have sent things to Syria and the refugees. We have sent things to, to different places, to different things that we see and different atrocities we see. We say, Here, here's God, how does God want to love on this? And we send it with people that we know are going to bring the love of God with it because we don't want to just meet a need. See, I don't want to make someone's life better here, but their spiritual life still in the toilet. I want it to have a combination. I mean, if I make a person's life here good, but they don't know Jesus, I didn't help them out that much, did I? I want it to be in combination. One of the things I love about living well, what I love about last well, living well is a different one. What I love about last well, they have never abandoned the gospel. It is one of the few ministries that I know that is a social justice type ministry that has stayed true to the gospel. And they make sure that every help that comes is connected to this is your God who loves you, who chases you, who pursues you, and has died for you, and um, wants you. And, and they connect it. We look for ministries that do that because we want to connect that the reason that this is here is because of the love of God. And they need to have that understanding that, that God loves them. So we, we, we do that. Um, Acts chapter 4 says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. So now we're in the New Testament. Talking about the church. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought, brought the money from the sales, and put the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. One of the things I see here is, the way he's talking about here is, we take care of our own. I mean, there is a heart to take care of those outside, but we also got to take care of our own. So we don't want to be so giving that we can't take care of people that are in our own community. This is a reason for a benevolence fund. What people were doing is, is they are making sure their people were not in need. 
Now here's one thing I want you to see here, and it's, it's actually a wise thing, but it's not often followed. And it's one thing I think is kind of important. Um, they would take things and they would lay it at the apostles' feet. This doesn't sound like a, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, because what happens oftentimes is you're going to see needs, and you're going to see needs within our own congregation, and you're going to see people's tears, and you're going to begin to feel it if you haven't already, and, or you're going to feel it with more greater detail than you already have. One of the dangers in being compassionate is that sometimes we actually aren't helping with our compassion. Now, here's what I mean. Sometimes people have a need because it was self-created. Meaning that they find themselves in a situation because of some choices that they've made. It's not circumstances, it's choices. Or they're in a place of need because they didn't have knowledge of something. They just didn't know. What would happen here in the New Testament church in Acts chapter 4 is they would uh, sell things or they would take an abundance and they would lay at the apostles' feet and then they trusted the apostles to distribute it as the need was there and with wisdom. And I can tell you, um, this is not something I'm speaking to right now. This is not something I'm trying to correct. This is not something that I, I'm oh, privy to. This is just something that I've watched happen in my 20-something years of ministry what I see happen sometimes is we start helping someone. Some people come to us, we begin to help them. We actually offer them benevolence. We begin to walk them through a path and we begin to help them continue down the path. Very often what we'll do is we'll say, hey, here's the deal. We've got some money to get you through this emergency situation. If you continue down this path, we'll have some more money that comes in to continue to help you through this. We know it's going to take a while. It's going to take a long time. We want to be with you through the long haul. And we ask that they follow certain uh, steps to uh, continue to walk down that path. And to walk down a road, they might become self-sustaining, if possible. It depends on the circumstances. But with that, what happens is, while we're taking down the path, and this happens a lot, they stop walking the path of discipline. They stop doing uh, the things that would help them get well. They stop doing the things that would help them learn what to do with their money. They stop doing those difficult things. As they stop doing that, poverty returns. And here's the danger. Sometimes people in the congregation are very well-meaning. And they hear and they see the tears. They don't know what's going on. And they hear part of a story and they begin to help that person. Well, as they begin to help that person, uh, it's well-meaning, it's well-intentioned, and I love the heart behind it. I never want to correct the heart. There's nothing wrong with that heart. The heart says, this person needs to help them. But what happens is it prolongs poverty because there's no discipline. Here's the only thing that I would ask. If there's someone in need, and there's someone in our congregation you know is in need, would you mind just letting me know about it? There may be some things that we already know. There may be some ways we've already stepped in. There may be a path we're already down with this person. And then we might be able to say, hey, would you like to come alongside us as we help together? So we don't do things individually, we do it together. And with that, the goal is a long-term goal, not just a short-term goal. This is part of the thing here that would lay at the apostles' feet, because they would work together for the betterment that was long-lasting, not just short-term. Well-meaning can cause lots of problems, because it causes a person or allows that person to stay in the, in the thing that got them to that place to begin with. 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is God's heart. You know what they did in the church? They had what's called a widow's list. You can read about it. I'm not going to read about it today. Don't have time. But a widow's list was a person who is a widow. Bless you. And they recognize that there are widows that are older, and there's widows that are younger. And they would put widows on what was called the widow's list. It was if they were older, and they, they uh, didn't have family to care for them. They didn't have ways to, to care for themselves, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so what they did, they put them on the widow's list. And then you know what happened? The church took care of them. And once they went on the widow's list, it became the church's responsibility. We will care for them. Here's why. Because God views the church as a family. If you don't have family to take care of you, this family will take care of you. If you don't have a family will call you their own, this family will call you their own. This is the heart of God. And he wants his church to operate that way. First Timothy is a letter... Um, from Paul to Timothy teaching him what it meant to pastor. And he was told as he's pastor, make sure there's a widow's list. 
Make sure that you take care of those who really are alone and don't have anything. Galatians chapter 2, I promise you we're almost done. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Here's what he says. Paul is getting ready. I mean, he's been ministering to the Gentiles. He's been giving the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter, Cephas, Peter and John have been ministering to the Jews. There becomes this question of, is the gospel for the Gentiles or just for the Jews? So Paul comes into the presence of Peter and John, and they begin to examine, and, and they also come in the presence of James, they begin to examine, is Paul legit, and is God really going to the Gentiles? In that meeting, they decide, yeah, yeah, he is. And Paul, that ministry, that's awesome. Go, go do that. And they basically give blessing to it. But here's the thing. As they give blessing to it, go bring the gospel. Go tell people about what Jesus has done. Go tell them that Jesus is for the Gentiles too. Go tell them that his death and his burial and his resurrection is for anyone who will believe. You scream that from the mountaintops. But don't forget the poor. Make sure that the gospel is always connected with that. That's important. And sometimes one gets elevated over the other. And I've seen it go both ways. Sometimes we remember the poor and not the gospel. Sometimes we remember the gospel and not the poor. You have to have them both there. In Matthew 6, 1 through 4, it says this. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, it's the heart of God. The heart of God is to care for people. Here's what's not the heart of God. Did you see what I just did? Let me tell you what's not the heart of God. Man, I'm amazing. Look at all that money I just threw over there. Here, here, here's, here's what's not, not the heart of God. Wait till everybody's in the room and make your way over and prance over and go, don't do a show of it. Now, here's the deal. I want you to see this word, reward. There is a reward. There's a reward. Right? And you're going to get one or the other. See, when you give in such a way that others see it, you'll be rewarded. You will. Other people will think you're really kind. They'll think you're really generous. They'll think you're really giving. They'll pat you on the back. They'll even say, man, I wish I was more like you. There's a reward. You'll get it. You just don't want it. You know why you don't want it? Because it just doesn't last. There's another reward. There's a reward of God. And the reward of God is this. He'll bless the one who has the heart of God. He goes, I know no one saw that. But I did. I know no one saw that. I did. I'll reward you because you have my heart. You've got my heart. See, God doesn't want us to have a law. He wants us to have his heart. Now, there's a story that Jesus um, was watching, and he saw this poor woman. She was poor as could be. She reached in her pocket, and all she had was two very small coins, and she put it in the offering box. This other person saw it, and when he saw it, he was like, well, that's nothing. That person's only given this. I give this much. That person only gives this. And Jesus is like, I tell you the truth, that woman and her poverty gave way more than you've ever given in your entire life. Because her heart is so different from yours. She took out of what she didn't have because she wanted to bless some people. And I'll tell you, some of the best givers I know are actually the people that don't have much to begin with. Because they know the pain and they want to help other people too. Don't judge someone based on what they give. Don't judge someone on how they give. Don't judge someone on when they give. Um, but also, when you're giving... Don't do it for someone else to recognize it. Don't do it for someone else to see it. Don't do it for someone else to praise you about it. You'll get the reward. It's just not the one you want. I think this is the last one. Oh, there's two more. Second Corinthians 8, 3 through 4. For I testify they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. Here's the important thing. There is no such thing as a tithe in the New Testament. That's Old Testament law. You're under no compulsion to give. You're under no compulsion to, to do any of that. Instead, 
You just give it out of your own heart. That's it. But entirely on their own. That's how you give. Whatever's on your heart. And they pleaded for the privilege of sharing in the service. For them, they saw it as ministry. Like We get to be together and share in this together. That's what they wanted to be a part of. And the last one is this. Each one of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly. Or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. If anyone guilts you into giving, run from them. If anyone tells you that you're going to be blessed because you give, I mean, there's probably some truth to that, but they're usually manipulating you. Run from them. Unless they're just trying to point out something that's really for your benefit. If they're using it for their benefit, run from them. Here's the deal. You have the desire, and you get the free choice to decide how do you want to give. Here's the deal. God looks around, and he sees tears. He wants his people to look around and see tears too. And as you see tears, and as your heart begins to connect with it, do you want to give towards that? And if so, decide in your own heart what, when, how. And then with it, do it cheerfully. It's just cheerfully. Which means it's like, it's just, I was glad to do it. It was, it was the thing I longed to do. And it wasn't for any other reason. If, if you are under law, here's how you know. If you do it grudgingly. If you've got to pry these things open to get it out, well, that's not cheerful giving. And you know what? God doesn't know you're going, well, I'm glad it finally came out. No. You know what he's, he's actually looking at? He's like, he's not looking at, will the fingers open? He's looking at, will the heart open? Will this open? Will this become inflamed for, with love for people? Will this become inflamed to care for people in their need? Will this have the heartbeat of God? He's not trying to open a hand. He's trying to open a heart. When a heart opens, the hand opens. When the heart opens, people begin to be blessed. When the heart opens, this is a question of your heart. It's a question of my heart. I wanted to follow up Ecclesiastes 4 with that. Because I didn't feel like we could really talk about last week, this, this message of Ecclesiastes 4, without this follow-up. Without this understanding of this is what God's calling for. And without... We'll give him a second just to come in. I also didn't want to, want to talk about Ecclesiastes 4 without a chance to celebrate. To celebrate the good things that I see, the good things that I hear about, that a chance that, um, this will contradict scripture a little bit, but give me some, uh, the chance that I get to brag on a congregation that has the heart of God. And I said it contradicts a little bit because I don't want to give you a reward. But, <laughs> but it is a privilege to call you my brothers and sisters, it is my honor to be taught by you what it means to give. I have learned more about generosity, more about caring, more about sacrifice for the betterment of others from you people. You have enriched my life and my understanding of what it means to give. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to how God continues to use us. And I also want you to know, like, what does this offering go to? And it goes in those places. Yeah, it, it, it also takes care of Melissa and I. But it goes in these other places because we want, as a congregation, together to share in. Let's go help the poor and oppressed. The last thing is one last announcement. Generosity feeds should fall in line with that. Generosity feeds where we're going to make food for all these kids that don't have stuff to eat. Well, as God would have it, September 24th is what we planned, and it's not what God planned. So we're not doing it September 24th. We don't have a date yet. Most likely it's going to be next spring. But let me tell you why. And this is more of an announcement, but it comes in line. Um, we found out we had the place reserved. We thought we were good. And then in June, we were told, oh, by the way, you need this, 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 and this. Things we didn't know we needed. And once we needed those things... What we had reserved was no longer sufficient, and we were unable, because of the summer, to secure the school 
for the time frame that we would need beyond September 24th. We just can't do it. Jody went, and we've been looking at where else can we go, what else can we do, and how else can we do this? And so she went down. We're not sure exactly this is what God has for us. We're getting our eyes open to more things. Um, there's a community in residence called Southgate. It's Section 8 housing. And there's a lot of poor and oppressed in the, this housing scenario. There's a ministry there that um, blesses those people. We went to them to see could we possibly, in conjunction with them, use their space and partner with them to do the Generosity Feeds event. Um, and so basically we're, we're looking at and exploring is that the way. But it seems like if it is, great. If it's not, God's expanding our vision. Southgate is 10 minutes down the road in Reston. And this other group of people we didn't know about before, they mentor kids in schools. They uh, do a whole bunch of other programs to help people out. There's a whole lot of things that are more holistic. And it's not just a, a food handout. It's just going to have the opportunity to connect us with a community that's in our own community that is um, some of the oppressed that we can begin to minister to alongside them. There is a church that already helps out, and they'd be lo loving and willing to take another one. And so we're looking to see, can we expand this, and does God have a bigger idea than we did? And we think he does. And we think that we're looking for a way to get connected in Reston to do our Generosity Feeds event just 10 minutes down the road there instead of here. And then we also think it's quite possible that this group in Southgate will actually take the food as well. So it won't go just to the schools, it'll go also to them which has also been part of our problem. One of the additional things is we have to have storage after the event. We were not told this because there's not enough places to send all the food immediately. We have to store it so the schools will get it later when they need it later. So we told Southgate about this situation. They said, how many of these can you do? And can we do a bunch of them? Because they could get rid of them all like now. Um, so it's a way we could give it to the school and we could give it to them and we could do another one we can do another one? I don't know. We don't know, but this all happened last week, and our mind's just kind of trying to figure out what God's doing. So our event on September 24th has been canceled because it's too small. <laughs> A new event is being created in 2018 or, or later this year that's much bigger than we ever dreamed. So together, <laughs> but, but together, we get to share in the ministry of seeing the tears and being the hands and the feet that comfort. Because Ecclesiastes, I looked around and I saw all this oppression and there was no comforter. May it be that there be all this oppression and people who go around goes, there's the comforter. It's the Lord Jesus through his church and we want to be a part of it. So, just wanted to tell you about that. Thanks for uh, letting me go along. I know I did. Rise to your feet. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being the God who sees people. You saw us first. You saw us in our pain. You saw us in our toil. You saw us in our oppression. You saw us in our spiritual bankruptness. And you've seen our physical needs. You've seen our spiritual needs. Thank you for finding us, for pursuing us, and comforting us. Yeah, we pray that you would make us to be a people that are open-hearted, that are loving, and generous and kind. We pray that you would continue to make us a people who bless others through your leading, that others would experience you as the comforter. We don't want to be experienced as a comforter. We want you to be experienced as a comforter, and we just ask you to do it through us. God, give us eyes to see it. Give us a vision that's bigger than our own. And God, I also recognize that there are needs in our own congregation. Ones we know about, ones we don't. So we just ask you to move on all our behalfs. And we thank you for all the ways you've already blessed us. Give us a thankful and grateful heart that sees all the good things you're doing. At the same time, we lift to you our needs. Watch over us. Protect us. Provide for us. Be our shield. Be our guard. Be our everything. In Jesus' name, amen.